My name is Anasar Rahman and I'm a professor of rheumatology at University College London. It's a pleasure to be asked to give this talk by different strokes today because I do a lot of work in the antiphospholipid syndrome which is highly relevant to young people who've had strokes. APS stands for the antiphospholipid syndrome. Now this is a syndrome which was first recognised in the 1980s, about 1983. And it's a syndrome where people are more prone to having clots in their blood vessels. So the blood vessels which go around the body delivering blood to various organs. And people with this syndrome can also have a history of recurrent miscarriages. So there's really two arms to the syndrome, the people who get clots and the people who get miscarriages. So with respect to the clots, one type of clot people can get is in the arteries that go to the brain. And if you get a clot in one of the arteries going to the brain, that could give you a stroke. Now, something that people often ask is what causes the antiphospholipid syndrome? Why do people get these clots? And the answer is that it's a disease of the immune system. There are many different diseases where the immune system starts to attack our own body. So the immune system is there to protect us. But in some cases, it can turn against us and start to attack our body. Those diseases are called autoimmune diseases, and antiphospholipid syndrome is one of those autoimmune diseases. Antiphospholipid syndrome isn't very common. It's thought to occur in about one in 2,000 people. So it's not a very common disease, but it can be a very serious disease because if a person gets repeated clots, clots over and over again, that can clearly cause a big problem for that person. And if the clot leads to something which causes ongoing damage, such as a stroke, again, that can be a problem. And finally, if the antiphospholipid syndrome leads to a lady having recurrent miscarriages, that's clearly very distressing. Now, I said that it was an autoimmune disease, the immune system turning against our own body. And the way in which it does that in this syndrome is that the body makes antibodies, antibody molecules, which attach on to fat proteins, uh, fats and proteins which attach to fats. And the particular thing that the antibodies attack is something called beta-2 glycoprotein 1. It's not important to remember exactly what that is. It is important to remember that we all have it. Everybody has beta-2 glycoprotein 1, but most people don't have antibodies to it. Only the people with this syndrome seem to have antibodies which cause a problem leading to the clots. So the people have the antibodies to this protein and in these people it can lead to clots. So our challenge as doctors is to try and stop the people who have these potentially problematic antibodies from developing clots or strokes or miscarriages. So who is more at risk for APS? APS can affect people of any ethnic origin and it can both affect women and men and it can affect any age group. Even children, although very rarely, can sometimes develop APS. It is slightly more common in women than men, but that doesn't mean men can't get it. Both men and women can get it. In terms of the genetics, there are probably some genes which are associated with APS, but it's not clear cut. There isn't any one particular gene. It's not a genetic disease. Many people ask if APS runs in families, and it is true that some families seem to have a tendency to different autoimmune diseases. So one member of the family might have one such disease and another member might have another. In my experience, it's quite rare, quite rare for more than one person in a family to have APS, but I have definitely seen cases like that and I've heard of cases like that. So I suppose if you're thinking about um, whether a particular person has a risk of APS, one thing would be if they already had another disease such as lupus. People with lupus are at increased risk of APS, but your ethnicity or your age or anything like that, it doesn't either prevent you from having APS or cause you to have more APS. It can happen to anybody, but I do stress it's quite a rare condition, one in 2000. The diagnosis of APS depends on blood tests. So essentially to diagnose APS, a person has to have at least one clinical criterion and one laboratory criterion. 
Let me explain. The clinical features. You can't diagnose APS unless a person has either had a history of a thrombosis, a clot in one of their blood vessels, or they've had a history of recurrent miscarriages or a particular sort of late miscarriage. So we're going to put the miscarriages and the pregnancy issues on the side for the moment because I know this is a group which is more about strokes. So if you think about the vascular thrombosis, a person must have had a clot in at least one artery or one vein. But that's not enough because a lot of people have a history of clots. A lot of people have had thrombosis. Many people have had strokes. Just having had that isn't enough to diagnose the APS. To diagnose APS, you must also test positive in a specific blood test for the syndrome. Now, there are three blood tests which are generally used. One is called the anti-cardiolipin or ACL test. One is called the anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 test and one is called the lupus anticoagulant test. So there are three tests. And you can't be diagnosed with APS unless you've tested positive in at least one of these tests, at least one. You don't have to be positive in all three, but you have to be positive in at least one. And you really have to be persistently positive. That is, it's not a test which was positive one day and then it went away forever. So let me tell you a little bit about these tests. They will take your blood, they will take the blood of the patient and they will send it to a laboratory. The anti-cardiolipin test is where they take cardiolipin, which is a kind of fat molecule which occurs in the body. They take the cardiolipin, they put it on a plastic plate and they add the patient's blood to it to see if the patient's blood have antibodies which stick to cardiolipin. That's what they do. And in the test, they can work out how much the level of the antibodies which is positive. So the result of that test will come as a number. They might say your anticardiolipin level is 5 or your anticardiolipin level is 95, for example. The anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 test is quite similar. In that case, they put the beta-2 glycoprotein 1 protein on the plastic plate and add the patient's blood to it and see if the patient has antibodies that bind to beta-2 glycoprotein 1. And again, the result is a number. So with those two tests, you'll get two numbers. You can say uh, this patient has a high level of anticardiolipin, this patient has a high level of anti-2 beta-2 glycoprotein 1, or it could be normal for both of those. That's how those tests work. Now the lupus anticoagulant test is a different sort of test. You don't get a number for that test, you get a positive or a negative. Now this test is very badly named. Lupus anticoagulant test is very badly named because it isn't a test for lupus. It's called that because it was initially invented to test people with lupus. But it's really important for me to tell you that the lupus anticoagulant test is not a test for lupus because many people find they're positive in that test and immediately worry they've got lupus. It's not a test for lupus, it's a test for the antiphospholipid syndrome. And how the test works is that they take the patient's blood and they look at the way in which it clots. Now, people with this syndrome, their blood clots abnormally. It doesn't clot the same way as other people's blood. And by doing various chemical changes or adding normal blood to it in the laboratory, they can work out whether that abnormal clotting is due to antiphospholipid antibodies. So the lupus anticoagulant test can be either positive or negative. So I want you to imagine that I am a patient and I've had a clot and they're testing me to see if I have antiphospholipid syndrome. They send off these three tests, anti-cardiolipin, anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 and lupus anticoagulant. If all the tests are negative, I don't have the antiphospholipid syndrome. If one of the tests is positive, I might have antiphospholipid syndrome and they may repeat it in a few weeks. But if the tests are very highly positive or more than one of the tests are positive, I'm very likely to have the antiphospholipid syndrome. And this is how we make the diagnosis of antiphospholipid syndrome. So I've already mentioned that APS is characterised by clots in blood vessels. Arteries are very important blood vessels. The arteries are the blood vessels which take blood to organs. There are different arteries going to different parts of the body. So, for example, the coronary arteries go to the heart. The renal arteries go to the kidneys. And there are arteries which go to the brain, 
which supply the tissues of the brain. And these are really, really important arteries, because if you were to get a blockage or a clot in one of those arteries, it can cause damage to the brain. And that is what we call a stroke. Now, there are two types of stroke. There are strokes which are caused by clots, and there are strokes which are caused by bleeding in the brain. Antiphospholipid syndrome doesn't cause the strokes which are due to bleeding in the brain, but it can cause the strokes which are due to a clot forming in the arteries of the brain. Now, strokes get more common as people get older, but young strokes, strokes in people under 50, are unusual. And a study in the Netherlands a few years ago found that one third of strokes in people under 50 could be due to the antiphospholipid syndrome. In other words, it's a very important cause of strokes in younger people, the antiphospholipid syndrome is. So what treatments can be given to get those people living with APS? Essentially, our treatments are preventative. So what we're trying to do is stop people having further strokes or further clots or further miscarriages. And the key thing is to make the diagnosis. So a person who's got antiphospholipid syndrome and has developed some sort of clot, in order to stop them having it again, they need to be on blood thinning medication or anticoagulant medication. These are drugs such as warfarin or heparin, typically. Warfarin is a tablet, heparin is an injection. Warfarin is the one which is most commonly used. Now, this is important because most people who have clots or strokes don't have to be on warfarin for the long term. They don't have to be on warfarin or blood thinning medications for the rest of their lives. But people who have a clot and are found to have antiphospholipid syndrome, they do have to be on those medications long term because the evidence is that that is the best way of stopping them from getting another stroke or another clot. So it's a question of how long you have to carry on the blood thinning or anticoagulant medication. So the treatment is not to cure what has already happened, but to prevent another thing happening. Long-term treatment with anticoagulation or blood thinning medications. Now, this is quite a big deal for the patient. These medications are not necessarily easy to take because you often have to have regular blood tests to see if you're on the right level of the medication. Sometimes there can be side effects such as bleeding. It can alter your ability to do other things. For example, I had a patient who was on these and had to stop doing some sort of sports that he used to do. So taking these medications long term is um, something which is quite tricky for patients to do sometimes. And that's why in research, we're trying to find different ways of treating this disease. But currently, it's the anticoagulation drugs which are the main factor used to treat it, to try and prevent further clots from happening. There are some new drugs, drugs like rivaroxaban, which have taken the place of warfarin for some people. At the moment, these are not being used routinely in the antiphospholipid syndrome because the trials didn't favor the use of those drugs, but more trials may be done in the future. When people are on warfarin in particular, the doctors can choose how thin to make the blood. In other words, how much warfarin to give to prevent clots. This is done by measuring something called the INR. The INR is a number. The higher the INR, the thinner or the, the less likely to clot they're making your blood. So there's a balance. If you have a very high INR, you might have a risk of bleeding, but less risk of clotting. If you have a low INR, you have less risk of bleeding, but you're not thinning the blood as much. Very often, people who've had strokes are run at a slightly higher INR than people who've just had clots, for example, in their leg or something like that. So if a person is on warfarin, the INR number, the target INR, the INR that they want you to be at, is something which is very important to know. So finally, just a little bit about pregnancy. In pregnancy, you can't use warfarin. A pregnant woman with APS, in order to prevent her having a miscarriage, is usually given heparin injections and aspirin throughout the pregnancy. So just thinking about people who might have had antiphospholipid syndrome causing a clot in the past, and then they want to become pregnant, they can become pregnant, but they have to stop warfarin and they may be put onto heparin and aspirin. 
I certainly have a patient of my own who had antiphospholipid antibody syndrome very young with a stroke and subsequently went on to have a lovely little girl and went through her pregnancy. So it can happen, but it has to be monitored very closely. APS Support UK is the biggest UK organisation supporting people with the antiphospholipid syndrome. We've been around for many years. We have a range of different patient materials available on the website and also in terms of leaflets. We have a helpline and people do sometimes ring for advice and we try and put out um, announcements on our website about things relevant to people with the antiphospholipid syndrome. We also have small research grants to support research into the APS. And actually my group at University College London has been doing some research and APS Support UK have helped us a lot in terms of getting advice from the patient perspective and so on. But I think one thing in particular for different strokes members is that we worked to change the national stroke guidelines. So we thought it was really, really important for people who had strokes to have this diagnosis considered because if you make the diagnosis it's, it means that the person will be put on to anticoagulation for a longer period to protect them more so it's important to make the diagnosis so for that reason we got in touch with the people writing the national stroke, stroke guidelines the guidelines that all hospitals use for people who are admitted to stroke units and we appealed to them to include testing for antiphospholipid syndrome amongst the tests which are done for people who are admitted to those units and we succeeded so the guidelines were changed so that people who for example were younger or who had other diseases such as lupus or had a history of recurrent miscarriages people in whom there would be a suspicion of APS those people should now be tested for APS when they're admitted to stroke units so we made that argument and we succeeded and we always try to support people with APS and to increase the profile of this syndrome, for example, by talking to the press. And there is a website by which you could contact us.